I'm Aaron Maté sitting in for Jimmy Dore here with Seymour Hirsch, investigative journalist who writes at seymourhirsch.substack.com. And Cy, this is the headline of your story from a few months ago, How America Took Out the Nord Stream Pipeline. And you reported in detail how the Biden administration was behind the bombing of the Nord Stream Pipeline. And this led to media silence, corporate outlets refusing to touch your story. Until many months later in March, this came from the New York Times, when they had a counter story to yours, which said intelligence suggests pro-Ukrainian group sabotage pipelines, U.S. officials say. <laughs> and they even they were so into their scoop that they even called this the first significant known, known lead about who was responsible for the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines. So your initial story, according to them, was not a significant lead. Their story that this was some unnamed pro-Ukrainian group. And of course, if you read the story, there was no evidence at all. They didn't specify uh, who this group was, uh, who was behind them, <clears throat> how they did it. There was no information at all, but yet they called their story the first significant known lead. And for the first time, the New York Times mentioned your story, uh, which came many months before, or, or uh, about a month before. Uh, but they even mischaracterized your reporting because they said that you based your reporting that the Biden administration was behind it on public statements from the White House, people like uh, Victoria Nuland and Anthony Blinken saying how great this was, this was bombed. They missed that you, your entire story was based on a source who provided a very detailed account down to the operational details about how this happened. So uh, you responded with this story uh, a few weeks later called the Nord Stream Ghost Ship, the false details in the CIA's cover story, uh, blowing a hole in the attempts to uh, counter you. And then this came to the New York Times. This was their response shortly afterwards, that uh, suspicions multiply as Nord Stream sabotage remains unsolved. And then they say, it may be in no one's interest to reveal more. <laughs> Are they threatening you through the New York Times? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. So that's the top. So, so I'm just wondering, you've seen now, there have been multiple attempts to try to uh, refute your story. All of them have collapsed to the point where now the Times is saying, you know what, let's not look any further. It might be in no one's interest to reveal more. Well, probably not, you know, because um, I must say the Ukraine story was published the same day uh, by the New York Times. And then uh, the Zeit, a paper in uh, Berlin, uh, published, uh, they had been working on the same story. And it never occurred to the reporter involved that, um, wait a second. Uh, it's 3,800 miles, you know, across the ocean We're from Washington to uh, to uh, Berlin. I, I think that's the main office of the newspaper. I'm not sure. Um, but um, how come the same tip I have, they have? <laughs> I mean, instead of rushing in the print, as he did that night, a story he'd been working on, he should have sat back and say, maybe told the fact that just do exactly the opposite story. There's something wrong because I was given the same tip here about a team. And how can it also be given from America? I mean, it, was, it wasn't that hard to put two and two together. It was really quite a dumb story uh, all the way around. <laughs> and the reporter at the Times, and one, one of the reporters, there were three on it. And I know one of them. Um, uh, uh, I don't know the uh, Adam Goldman. He's a very good reporter, done a lot of good stuff. I have no idea what what, what rock they were living on there. Anyway, the bottom line is, one of the three went on a podcast, an in-house podcast. You know, when I worked at the New York Times, I just wrote stories. <laughs> I didn't have podcasts. I didn't have to file. And they would call me sometimes, going on CNN or MSN, getting contracts. The, the Sometimes I remember once I was somewhere in the West, and I, had a, I was a running story, and I had a good story I filed that the paper used to let me file for page one as late as 7.30, and so um, when I was filing one story earlier, uh, the public relations people at the uh, New York Times said, you know, NBC wants to film you right now. You're in Denver, I think it was. They can get you to the studio and make the nightly news. And I said, oh, no, no, come on. It'll be in the paper tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go on TV. I'm just <laughs> now they're just trotting there, making probably as much money as or more than they do in the newspaper. How can you be a reporter if you can't spend all your time reporting? And you got to go. But, you know, it's just. Well, it's one not, of the, we on a podcast and he said, well, actually, we don't really know much. And I don't know much. And we none so, of us know what we were told this story by people who had access to intelligence. 
which makes that made me think of guys like John Kirby or maybe some press guy. John Kirby is a press guy that I've known for 15 years. And I, I'm, he's a very nice man. I, I, I did write about it, but, but you know, there's nothing wrong with him, but he's not a policymaker. It's just, uh, you haven't seen um, a wink and blinken or not, I call him. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> Tony Blinken and, and uh, Sullivan and Newland. You know, I don't, we have children, you know about that children's book. Um, I haven't seen them talk about this at any point. They haven't answered any questions. They don't even go to the, they had a big press conference. This is what I wrote about this week. They had a big major uh, uh, report they did about how everybody else screwed up on the Afghan pullout, but not us. And they left it to John Kirby, the spokesperson, has been, I knew him when he was a, a lieutenant commander or, you know, when he was a young officer. And he's a restricted officer. I mean, by that I mean he's he's not permitted, even though he's a two star, not permitted to have a command, which isn't a blow against him. And you can be a, a in in the navy, you can be a cyber expert too, and also don't get a command. But that's just a fact. He's a surface guy who's been a public relations guy, and he's there defending the White House on this report. And that's just wrong. It's wrong for it's not fair to him. It's certainly not fair to the reporters. They got the report. I think I read the transcript ten minutes before. The news conference they got a long report and why i don't know why the white house press corps just doesn't one day walk out and say you've got to stop this mistreatment of us but they don't well because you mentioned they, so so you mentioned uh, one of the reporters on the on the cover story that was planted in the new york times this one intelligence suggests pro-ukrainian group sabotage pipelines u.s officials say one of the reporters on that story is named julian barnes and you mentioned this, and I have the clip. We're going to play, not the whole thing, just a little bit of it. He went on the New York Times podcast, The Daily, and he explained the reporting methods that generated that story. And in his words, it was only when him and his colleagues started asking the right questions that they got the right answers. And that right question was, what if this wasn't a government, but what if this was some non-government actor? And then he says they got the right answer. So this is some of what he said. So, Julian, who exactly was responsible for this attack and how did you and our colleagues go about figuring that out? Well, I think what happened was for much of the investigation, we weren't asking exactly the right questions. Hmm. And what were the right questions? Well, we had logically been focused on countries, mm -hmm. all those states that we just went through. Did Russia do it? Did the Ukraine state do it? And that was just hitting Notice how he didn't ask, did our own government do it? Did the U.S. do it? Those weren't do honest list of questions. Did and write a book called, If I Did It, This Is How I Would Have Done It. <laughs> dead end after dead end. We weren't finding officials who were telling us that there was credible evidence pointing at a government. We weren't finding officials telling us what to say. Basically. <laughs> that's, that's what he's saying here. Let me bring Cy Hirsch back in. Uh, yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, this is... Um, uh, you know, uh, there's a journalist admitting that he's taking direction from officials. And then finally, when they tell him the right answer, he's now thinks he's come across the real story, even though his story itself contained no evidence or details whatsoever. Uh, you know, uh, how much can you beat up the New York Times? You know, the day's too short. So, <laughs> you know, I read it and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I still am a subscriber. I've, I've been reading that paper since 1962. I read it all the time. I mean, when you have to know what it was like in the early days of the Vietnam War, the Times had people like Homer Bigger and uh, David Halberstam and later Neil Sheehan uh, writing uh, about the war. Uh, uh, and it was just brilliant stuff, amazing stuff. And it was just a pleasure to see a paper doing that while the Washington Bureau always was a little more staid. Um, and um, so for me to remember that, that kind of reporting, and to remember the the uh, the honesty and the integrity of the reporters, and then to hear what you just heard, yes, that wouldn't have happened. That wouldn't be that wouldn't pass the mustard now. But there's some there's uh, look. Uh, we all know what the story is. The problem is that the, the Trump has panicked everybody. The Trump phenomenon. Now we have DeSantis. We have the phenomenon, and you know people are talking about a. a, a, a um, uh, the, the only thing that may save the Democrats. Um, uh, is the abortion issue because that that that's one even in regions you wouldn't expect like in Nebraska you wouldn't expect it to work it does but I don't know what's going to save us uh, from um, um, the complete ignorance that the White House shows about foreign policy 
and the inability to even begin to think about the diminishment of in the last couple of years of America, um, not only financially, because we guessed wrong on the sanctions with Russia, yeah. uh, but also just in terms of uh, the Chinese doing things we couldn't do. Um, uh, they, you cut a deal with Iran, and the next thing you know, the Iranians are, re- are, Iranians are restraining the Houthis in Yemen. So we get a settlement there that we tried to do. Uh, meanwhile, we're still, you know, uh, we're still supplying the bombs, you know, the missiles that the, the Saudis were firing into the war. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just so strange uh, for me to see. We've had terrible governments before, absolutely. You know what Bush and Cheney did, uh, the, the Islamofascism, uh, the stupid decision that the solution to Al Qaeda was to go after uh, uh, Saddam, who hated the radicals, and then to go after Bashar, who, who not only did he hate the Muslim, you know, like his father did. Remember what uh, he, he, they blew up a city. The Muslim but, Brotherhood, yeah. You know what? But but, but, but uh, Shah Assad gave us some amazing information in the first two years, hmm. really reliable information about what was going on because he had very good intelligence about that helped it. capture an operative for Al Qaeda or or identify an, an well, operative they, for Al Qaeda. There, yeah. there was going to be an attack on the Sixth Fleet. Uh, no, this, it's not the Sixth Fleet. I think it's the Fifth in uh, in um, uh, on the Gulf. Yeah, I think it's the Fifth Fleet. Uh, yeah, the Seventh is in, the Sixth is in, in in is in Italy. But the Fifth Fleet is based in um, uh, Bahrain, I think. There was a big attack planned, and we stopped people doing it with this intelligence. And he got the reward for that is to be called part of the, you know, an adjunct to the excess of evil. So um, there you are. Um, um, it's just amazing to me how we could we could fly off the rails that we have. And the newspapers, instead of being corrected, are into it. And it's just, you know, I... You know, I can't. You can't win fighting. Um, um, you just can't win fighting it. You know, you just can't win. You can't win fighting it. I mean, every day I pick up the Washington Post, and there's a story that the first thing I see is a story that says the following story is written by five people. Well, there's the first one. <laughs> I've been, you got two people writing a story. There's blood on the table. Five people wrote the story. <laughs> it's the total domination of the desk or the editors. The, the touch of the editor. Uh, the new woman editor there. And um, it's just, you know, I, I'm, okay. If you want to convince me that five people wrote the story, um, I guess I'm convinced, but I'm not. It's crazy. It's just crazy. We're telling jokes in Nashville, Honolulu, Los Angeles, Northampton, Massachusetts, Syracuse, Coho's, New York, Hartford, Connecticut, Baltimore, Chicago, Rosemont, San Diego, and more. Go to jimmydoor.com to see get a link for all those tickets. Plus, you can watch my new special, COVID lies are funny. (laughs) 